in a conversation that we had offline, we talked about the the architecture of the foot because it's it's different than architecture of different parts of your body than than it is of different parts of your body. And there are two aspects of the foot which I find particularly interesting and also worth going into detail about. The first one are fat pads, and the second one is the nail plate, so or nail plates. So let's start with the fat pads. Uh, tell us what is a fat pad. Where are they located and what happens to fat pads when you develop peripheral neuropathy? It's a good question. And, uh, you know, the, the fat pad itself is essentially acting as uh, a shock absorber for your entire axial load as you're walking or taking steps. And those steps are extremely additive over the course of uh, months to years uh, and as we add birthdays, unfortunately. But at the same time, essentially what it's doing is it is providing a cushion for all of that weight that's being distributed over the course of the foot over time. And it, specific to the location of the fat pad, it's predominantly found under the ball of the foot. So distal to the arch, but just behind the toes on the underside of the foot, in addition to the heel. And those two locations are what basically are absorbing most of our weight through the heel strike, mid strike, and then you know propulsive phase of gait essentially as we walk. Um, there was a third part to that question, and I, I think I have not answered that. Yeah, the third question is uh, what happens when you develop? What happens specifically to the fat pads when you develop peripheral neuropathy? Is there a relationship between the two of them? Yeah, so that's an, a, a great question in and of itself. And so this is a highly debatable topic. And I think that we had talked uh, possibly offline about w what the thought process was behind fat pad atrophy. And is it associated with diabetic peripheral neuropathy? Is it an age-related thing? Is it a combination of the two? And I think it is an all of the above scenario. Uh, over time, we do know that we lose the fat pad just because of the number of birthdays. Uh, we can measure fat pad atrophy by ultrasound alone uh, in a non-invasive manner and actually see the decrease in regards to millimeters of thickness in the fat pad uh, in both the ball of the foot as well as the heel. Uh, specific to diabetic peripheral neuropathy, there's been several in investigator-initiated types of studies where they do believe that the peripheral nerves that are going into that area are leading to a decrease in adipocyte size and or functionality, which could in theory decrease the pad and or cushion itself, which could subsequently increase pressure, which would cause us to form callus, which would lead to potentially tissue breakdown over time. Uh, there's also been thought that the microvasculature associated with long-standing hyperglycemia could play an active role in the decrease in fat pad and or fat pad atrophy at the same time. So I think that it's uh, multifactorial, but at the same time, I think the greatest thing that we need to be paying attention to is whether or not we are losing our fat pad regardless of causality. And if we are, then we need to be having those conversations and educating our patient population as to the possible ramifications of a reduction in fat pad and or fat pad atrophy. And what are the possible solutions to fat pad atrophy, whether it be external, meaning some form of custom orthoses or orthotics external by way of a rigid stiff sole athletic shoe gear or some other form of shoe gear and or do we start having conversations about uh, fat pad transplantation, uh, allograft implantation or some other form of implantation in an attempt to uh, create an artificial fat pad so that with axial load, we do not develop that callus and or pain or discomfort over time. And that way we don't progress down that causal pathway towards uh, wounding infection and subsequent amputation. Yeah, okay. So uh, am I correct in saying that uh, fat pad atrophy also in, this, in the same way that 
peripheral neuropathy takes time. Fat pad atrophy also takes time. It's not something you just happen to, uh, you, don't, you don't atrophy your fat pad over the course of a few weeks or a month. It takes no. what, potentially years, correct? That would be the understanding is, yeah. is that this is a years long process. Right. And, you know, I always try to explain to patients uh, in a treatment room that fat pad, you can think of fat pad atrophy as one component being age, but then the secondary component being attributable to presumptively all three components of diabetic peripheral neuropathy as they pertain to the feet, the sensory component, the motor component, and the autonomic component. And so when you're working with patients and or trying to educate them on fat pad atrophy and diabetic peripheral neuropathy as it pertains to the feet, I think it warrants that conversation and making sure that the individual understands the three different components of the neuropathy and what role that may or might play as it pertains to fat pad atrophy. Because fat pad atrophy is not talked about as much as it should be, especially in the setting of having abnormal sensation to the feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've interacted with a lot of people who are living with diabetes who complain that, uh, they, you know, they don't use words like fat pad atrophy, you know, right. they don't use words like loss of sensation. They basically say, my feet hurt, right? right? It hurts to walk. It hurts to exercise. I can't jog, right? Uh, it feels like I have lightning bolts in my feet. I get pins and needles, right? But I think a lot of that is due to exactly what you did talking about, which is that the, the thickness of the fat pad actually decreases over the course of time, thus leading to, uh, you know, greater pain sensations uh, that can become very uncomfortable over time. Right. And if we want to wrap it up even one more notch, we could say, well, there's fat pad atrophy, but there's also distal displacement of the fat pad secondary to muscle atrophy from the motor component of the diabetic peripheral neuropathy, because that leads to shape changes and or changes to the existing architecture of the foot. And so if you think about it, like uh, as we have changes to motor innervation to the intrinsic muscles of the foot, what happens is we have muscle wasting, right? When we have muscle wasting, we have tendon imbalance. When we have tendon imbalance, I always try to tell my patients, it's like reins of a horse. Now, I don't ride a horse, so I hope that this analogy is appropriate. But if you were to remove the left-sided rein and we're only pulling on the right, that would be an imbalance that horse is only going to go in a clockwise circle and you're not going to get anywhere. Now, if you're talking about tendon imbalance in the foot, that's what leads to deformity, digital deformities in the toe, which is displacing the metatarsal towards the floor, which is displacing the fat pad and increasing the point of pressure with repetitive microtrauma over time, which once again leads to calluses and wounding. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you're basically saying that there's, you know, there's a, there's a strong relationship between the, the, the atrophy that you may develop in your fat pad and the musculature in your feet. As the atrophy progresses, the musculature in your feet also changes in order to adapt to a smaller fat pad uh, that used to be thicker. It's, it's all very intertwined. And that's why, as we were talking about at the top of the episode, neuropathy being such a weight, diabetic neuropathy being such a wastebasket term, right? Because as we start to really get into it, there's so many variables involved and every individual is unique and their pattern of behavior is going to be drastically different than the individual in the treatment room next to them. Yes, I hear exactly what you're saying. Okay, so let's let's talk about the nail plate then, because you talk about nail plate infections, and they're super important in the context of uh, you know immunocompromised people in particular. So, what is a nail plate infection, and and why do people who are immunocompromised why should they be paying attention to their nail plates as well? Right. So even in its most basic form, a nail plate infection could be something as minor as a, a fungal infection in your toenails, right? And so, is that a big deal? Is that a big deal, essentially, is what we're saying, right? Well, in an individual that's not immunocompromised or doesn't have diabetic peripheral neuropathy, they're going to realize that over time, that nail increases in thickness. It becomes more painful or burdensome. We have color change, which may or may not be 
extremely burdensome for an individual that's otherwise healthy or has a healthy foot per se, but in an individual that's immunocompromised and or does have diabetic peripheral neuropathy with an absence of sensation, they may not know when that nail plate is becoming so burdensome to the point that potentially something as minor as an ingrown nail can lead to the loss of a toe. And so these are extremely important variables that need to be looked at. And so something as minor as nail plate infections or fungal nails or onychomycosis, as we might call it for, for a mycotic or fungal nail plate, it is extremely important that individuals with diabetes, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, peripheral arterial disease, as you mentioned earlier, we would refer to it as what circulatory disease and or peripheral nerve dysfunction, you can start to see why something so traditionally benign is a potential landmine for an individual that doesn't have appropriate sensation to the foot. Okay, this is great. So can you do me a favor and define immunocompromised? Are you referring to people who are living with an autoimmune version of diabetes only? Or are you referring to you know, people who have developed prediabetes and type 2 diabetes? Are they also considered immunocompromised? I think it would be all of the above in addition to anybody that was taking any medication that was suppressing their immune system. Got it. Okay. So somebody who has an organ transplant, as an example, absolutely on, uh, immunosuppressant medication for the rest of their life, they're technically immunocompromised. Individual on high dose steroids, you know, it could be something as, as benign as that as well. So we really have to be paying attention to the status and or health of our patient and patient population when we're looking at things like this. And that gets back to the, the whole need for the creation of facilities that are doing nothing but managing this at-risk foot population. Valid. Okay. Very, very, very informative. This is, this is great.